We're going to be turning our attention this morning to the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 15. And I'm very thankful to have each and every one of you in the house of the Lord today. Very thankful for what we feel uh, in His house. What feels better when you get closer? I feel like I can reach out and touch you this morning and very, very thankful that you are here and thankful for even the good that the storm is doing. You know, storms are devastating and it has left horrible, horrible reports. But for all of the bad reports, there are amazingly good reports. And you may be seated just a moment. Um, Brother uh, Ken Sharp is here, and I want to give special honor to Brother Ken Sharp. He and Angel and uh, Adrian and Austin, they slept in a Sunday school room uh, in Portland at the church there. They helped paint. Uh, They unloaded four uh, pallets of shingles by hand uh, off of the trailers and put them on new pallets. And uh, they have worked very, very hard, and I want to give him special honor. Ken, would you stand? Very, very thankful for you. And God bless you. May be seated. Sarah, would you stand? Uh Sarah used to be Stanley, now it's Day, and uh, a lot of you have not had the privilege of meeting her husband, who is a uh, certified electrician and uh, works uh, right here at bases many times, military bases, call for his uh, professional expertise in electrical work, and uh, he um, is just amazing. He had uh, 10 days off. And he said, Pastor, I'd be more than happy to, to go. I'm, I'm just going to Rockport, and I'm going to try to help. And I said, well, man, uh, we have a place that you can go, uh, the United Pentecostal Church there in Rockport. Uh, Pastor Eddins uh, definitely needs help. And would you believe by the time we got there yesterday that Jeremy, her husband, has almost completely rewired the entire church building? Totally rewired it. And I can't tell you how much they appreciated uh, his abilities. And uh, he's just basically became the, the foreman around there and, and took charge and took leadership and, and was ready for 60 people when they showed up. And I want to give special honor uh, to Jeremy and say uh, thank you to Sarah for her willingness to let her husband go. She's been here alone, and he's been up there alone working hard. So thank you again, Sarah and Jeremy. And these are the kind of reports. Uh, One man was a volunteer for uh, Brother Stollard there in Portland and uh, didn't have the Holy Ghost, just had a heart to help hurting people. And went to church, he said, yeah, I'll come Sunday. And last Sunday received the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what happens. And uh, very positive things are happening all over the the district. Uh, People are stepping up and uh, brothers helping brothers, sisters helping sisters. There's Now, I would say for those of you who want to volunteer and desire to volunteer. Rockport is the place for you. There's no doubt in my mind that you could uh, drive to Rockport and drive around in general labor. When it comes to general labor, you could find something to do in about five minutes. Uh, Yesterday, Brother Cunningham, Mark Cunningham, one of our board members, he took a moment and drove around the city Uh, There were people feeding. There was work going on in the entire city. And one man, I think he said it correctly, he said a lot of people jumped the gun and they sent trailer loads of items to Rockport. Rockport wasn't ready for trailer loads. They had no place to store the goods. They had no electricity 
to refrigerate anything, and so uh, what wasn't protected uh, was destroyed. So right now, this week, is the week, really, uh, to send things to Rockport. This is the time to go down and volunteer, and there are always uh, things that you can do uh, for general labor and and helping people. So that would be uh, a, a target. Right there would be Rockport, and uh, you can coordinate through us. We can put you in contact uh, with people that you can help and, and find out the needs. In fact, Brother Rod Carpenter, pastors in Corpus, uh, said that, that this week, next week, and it's going to take months uh, and, and maybe uh, years to, to completely rebuild the city. So Aransas Pass, Rockport, those are areas that, that you certainly could be utilized. And if you'll come through the church, we'll do it in a uh, very organized fashion and put you in touch uh, with people. There, there are a lot of general labor opportunities. The grounds, uh, even there at Rockport United Pentecostal Church, uh, needs to be cleaned up. Uh, many, many things to do. Shingles all over the uh, around uh, the building, and, and th- that's something that could happen over the next couple of days. So God bless you. Thank you for your willingness to help, and uh, may God richly bless our church. Would you stand with me one more time? <laughs> you have your Bibles, the book of Second Chronicles chapter 15. Second Chronicles chapter 15, and we want to begin uh, reading this morning with verse 7. Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. The New Testament scripture that would parallel with this is uh, the one that indicates that we are to continue uh, to be strong in the Lord and uh, not to faint in a time of service because uh, God will reward our effort. He wants to bless us. He wants to, uh, to help us. And he said that you would reap if you faint not. And it's important that in a time like this and in a season like this, that we don't find ourselves fainting, but we find ourselves recommitting unto the Lord. This is, the end time is no time to be fainting. This is not time to be playing church. Uh, An amen or even a Baptist nod would be in order right now. It's not time to play church. It's time to be the church. It's not time to vacillate between worldliness and godliness. This is time to be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. This is not time to seek uh, the things of the world, but this is time to seek God. Notice with me in verse 8, And when Asa heard these words, and the prophecy of Obed the prophet, he took courage. And put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah and Benjamin. And out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim. And renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. Notice verse 7. Be ye strong therefore, let not your hands be weak. For your work shall be rewarded. In other words, the prophet is saying. God's going to reward an effort by those that seek Him. If you make an effort to seek the Lord and to consecrate unto the Lord, He is going to match it and reward you for your effort. And when they heard this, it made them want to consecrate even more. That God's going to reward your efforts for consecration. I wish that we as a people and we as a nation could, could hear that and that kind of proclamation would still have the impact upon our nation 
that it did these particular people. That when they heard that if you consecrate, God's going to reward you. If you if you consecrate and make an effort to seek God, that he's going to reward you, that it would cause us to deepen that consecration and to even do more to consecrate. In other words, when they heard that God was going to bless their effort, then they even put forth more effort to be consecrated unto God. And I wish that could happen again, that that if there's anything that should make a people want to please God more, it's understanding that God has blessed us already and not cursed us when we deserve to be cursed. In other words, if God has not judged you for your sin, you ought to be thankful and willing to consecrate unto the God who has been merciful to you. This nation, if we could grasp this, God's been merciful to us in spite of our sin. Our sin, our children's sin, you just think about it. Our nation's sin, our, our, our desire to, to be frivolous with our, our time and attention and our lust for the things of this world and ungodliness, and God has not judged us the way that he could judge us. I will go down on record that these storms are not the judgment of God. They are not the judgment of God. If God would judge this nation with water, it would have been judged a long time ago. God doesn't do that. He tempts no man with evil. That it happens on the just and the unjust. And uh, there, God made a proclamation and put a rainbow that I will not use floods to destroy the earth again to completely do it. And God is, is not, this is not the judgment of God upon the earth. The next judgment will be by fire and you don't want to be nowhere near here when it happens. Can I get a witness, somebody? So God bless you. You may be seated. Our subject this morning is a covenant to seek the Lord. Notice in verse 9, And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. Notice he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord God was with him. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month in the 15th year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had brought, 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep. And they entered into a covenant, notice this, to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all of their heart and with all of their soul. Notice that. Scripture, and this is where we will extract our text uh, this morning. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers, and with all of their heart, and with all of their soul. In other words, when they saw that God was with them, and God had anointed a man to preach to them, and to lead them into further... uh, consecration, that they at that time went into covenant as a people and said, it's time to seek the Lord. It's time to seek God with all of our heart, our mind, and our soul. It's time. How many would join with me and join with pastor to say, it's time to seek the Lord. It's time to seek the Lord. 
And they didn't only seek the Lord with a portion of their heart, but the Bible says with all their heart and with all their soul. They are pouring out their soul. That whosoever, notice this, that would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. Now that would certainly be an emphasis to pray if they knew if you don't pray, if you don't go into a covenant to seek the Lord with all of your heart and soul, you're going to die. Nobody is laughing. Nobody's smiling. But can you imagine if there's a proclamation, you either seek the Lord or you die? Well, the truth of the matter is, if we don't seek the Lord, we're going to die. We're going to die spiritually. But they, they felt that this is such an important time and season to seek the Lord that we're not going to take one or two that will not seek the Lord to cause us to receive judgment at God's hand. In other words, we want everybody to understand how important this is to us as a nation. It's time to seek the Lord or else. And if you don't seek the Lord, we're not going to take a chance of two or three people uh, not allowing us to be blessed by, by Almighty God because of your lack of commitment to seek him with your whole heart. Now, I'm sure that Israel had picked that up historically, realizing that judgment could come to a nation because of one man's sin, such as Adam. They got this naturally, realizing that Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. And they also realized that a nation could be judged by one man's sin like Achan, where Israel could not even defeat Ai, who was very small and should have been a, a very easy foe to, to, to win over. But they couldn't win because of one man's sin. So historically, they probably picked up that one or two uh, may affect how God would look at us as a nation. And look at us as a people. I pray that as God looks at this church, that he would see 100% of us with a clean heart and a clean mind, ready to seek the Lord with all of our (coughs) heart, mind, and soul. I understand that in a crowd like this, a pastor has no way of knowing what everybody in the church is doing and does not want to know. Can I get a witness? I am not the pastor that wants to know every little bad thing. Can you imagine God showing me at one time every bad thing that was going on by people in the church? How many of you would like to see it at one time? It'd make us all pass out, I'm sure. To see it at one time. I remember one man saying, I don't believe that ministry is a stressful as some of you preachers act like it is. So he charged God foolishly one morning and said, God, I don't believe that these preachers are telling the truth about their stress level. I don't believe it's that stressful. Put it all on me right now and let me feel it. Well, it didn't take him long to decide that, Lord, I changed my mind. I take it back. I don't want that kind of stress. So, you know, really, I am, I am the shepherd of the flock. I'm not a lord over it. I am here to, to shepherd the flock. I am to be a voice that will speak out against sin. I am, I am not to put my uh, proverbial head in the sand uh, when there are things going on within the body that would be detrimental. If this... Uh, body is full of sin and there are people in critical places that are uh, living one standard at church and another standard somewhere else that are pretending to be Christian here and adulterer somewhere else 
Am I still in the right church? Just want to make sure I'm in the right church. Uh, claim to be holy and righteous and sing about it and worship about it, but yet your life is full of fornication. There are times when preachers have to draw lines in the sand, and when we find out things and we know things, we have to deal with things. I have never been the preacher that... that uh, wanted to set people down, I've, I've had the spirit of wanting to set people up and believe in people, and, and I've never been the preacher that, that is anxious about setting someone down. But I have communicated with people and said, if there is sin in your life and you know it, you're living a double life, you need to set yourself down. It's not waiting on preacher to set you down. If you're living one life at church and another life somewhere else, uh, then you need to sit down and get your life in order. You need to get your heart right with God. You need to go into a covenant and seek a time of serving Him and living for Him with all of your heart. I've seen people that could dance and run and thank God for dancing and running. But this is not about entertainment, my friend. If you're dancing to be seen of man and dancing and singing for people, you're in the wrong church. We don't come here to be seen of man. We come here to offer worship unto God Almighty. I remember two young men I saw at first hand as a youth president, and I think of the youthfulness of this expression. And there was young men in the altar area, which youth camp is a very uh, very electric altar experience and a lot of conviction preaching and, and people come to the altar and make consecrations. And Wednesday night, we kind of knew it's going to be a runaway. By Wednesday, there's going to want to be some shouting and dancing and, and a little victory. And there would be times we'd talk. Now, if it's here tonight, let them run. Let them get after it. Let's have church tonight. Let it be a powerful experience. So it was one of those runaway services where it was enthusiastic and the worship was high. And One young man finally took the lead and broke out and started dancing. And then there was total chaos in the entire altar area. And all of the young people are dancing. And I I had my eyes open, and if you're a youth president with 750 campers, you better keep your eyes open (laughs) at all times. You better have your eyes open. And I looked out upon the congregation just in time to see a young man worshiping with his eyes shut, and he was doing the world of And he really got after it, more like a helicopter on steroids, and his arm come flying by and hit another kid upside the head who had his eyes closed, worshiping God, minding his own business, when this fellow's arm liked to took his head off. So I noticed, I saw it all in real time. Here he is. This kid is worshiping God. Boom! Hits him in the jaw. And this kid sees this kid now, still doing the whirly bird over there, he looks at him, acts like he's dancing, and whirly birds over to him and knocks his head off. Whether in the spirit or how the spirit, I cannot tell. Uh, but I happened to see it firsthand. I thought, my, 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 nowhere but youth camp can these things happen. We don't worship. That, that, that would be a fleshly vengeance is mine response. There's, the Spirit of God's nowhere near that. Neither is God in any of my performance based mentality where I think I'm doing this to be seen of man. I'm not doing this to be seen of man. I am worshiping unto Almighty God. I am worshiping Him with all of my heart and all of my soul. I appreciate our singers. I appreciate our musicians. 
I appreciate our wonderful, amazing choir, but this isn't about us, it's about Him. We don't come here for us. It's all about Him. (laughs) And when it's not unto God with all of our heart and all of our soul, then we have missed it. This is not about me this morning. Thank God for the mercy and the grace of God. I am not talking about perfection. I don't think there's anybody here that's reached a place of perfection. But it is about pursuit. It is about the right direction. I didn't say you had to be perfect to preach here. If you had to be perfect to preach here, there would never be anybody preaching to you. There isn't a perfect preacher on the planet. Nobody. We are full of imperfections. If these choir members had to be perfect to to sing to you, there wouldn't be any choir because there's nobody that is perfect. But imperfect people must be pursuing a perfect God. And we must be in pursuit of Almighty God. And our direction is either going to be pursuing God or pursuing sin. And we cannot pursue sin and God at the very same time. Am I in the right church? Am I in the right place? You cannot be pursuing sin and God to, well, how do you know it's sin? To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. To him, it is sin. If I know, and, and folks, it's not rocket science. People may wait for the preacher to tell them. If the preacher don't tell me, I'm not changing. If the preacher don't say anything about it, I'm not changing. There, there's people that are waiting on the preacher, but whether you wait on the preacher or not, if there's sin in your life, you know it. You don't have to be told. If you're living r- wrong, you know it. If you're not right with God, you know it. And I would say this, me- this message this morning, what is the point of this message? It's time to seek the Lord with all of our heart and our soul. It is time to go into a covenant with Almighty God. It is time for God to be able to look at our environment and say they are not perfect, but they are in pursuit of my perfection. They have not arrived yet. They are not uh, everything they can be and will be, but they're pursuing me, not sin. They're not drinking and going to clubs and nobody knows about it. They're not parting. They're not, they're not living immodest Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then all of a sudden Sunday, putting on their church clothes. You're, you're not what you wear to church. You're what you live 24 hours a day. You're not what you wear. You're who you are when you're all by yourself. You're who you are when there's nobody watching. You're who you are, and God help us to consecrate our heart completely and wholly to the Lord. Now, if I could take just a moment and historically uh, bring you up to speed in our text here this morning, the Bible said that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Azariah, the son of Obed who was called Obed, as his father was in Second Chronicles 15 and 8. Notice for a very long season, Israel uh, had been without the true God, and the Bible says in this particular chapter, without a priest and without the law. In other words, if there is not someone in charge, a priest or a prophet that is giving the law, people seem to go their own course. And unfortunately, in this case, they went away from God. And because there was no law, and because there was no prophet, because there was nobody teaching and proclaiming to them what they needed to hear for 12 years under Rehoboam and three years under Abiah, the the, uh, pursuit of God was totally neglected. These people are not pursuing God. But suddenly a prophet comes on the scene and says, those of you that are pursuing God, keep it up because God is going to reward your effort. 
In other words, there's been a godless society here, and there are things that are happening, and it didn't take long for the tyrants and the rage of those tyrants to take over, and it's brought you to where you're at. He said, but here's the good news. If you'll call on the Lord, He's going to reward you. If you'll keep seeking God, He's rewarding them that are seeking the Lord. And so when Asa heard that God was going to bless him for the steps that they had already made toward God, that word made them even want to do better. Listen, folks, we are perverted and messed up when the mercy of God takes us to greater sin instead of more consecration. When the mercy and grace of God, here's what you have to understand. In one particular chapter, it said, because judgment is not executed speedily, therefore, the hearts of the Son of Men are fully bent in them toward evil. In other words, they get in their mind because judgment has not come, that it will never come. And folks, let me tell you, I don't believe that that we are seeing direct judgments of God. I believe the earth is aging and it's beginning to show signs of its age. We're beginning to see what is happening all across the world. It was even prophesied that in the last days there would be wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, earthquakes in divers places. And and to me, it speaks of the age that we are living in. We are living in the last and the final hour. And would the church say amen? amen. But because judgment has not come... People think that judgment will not come. And he said, because judgment has not come, the hearts of the Son of Man are fully bent in them to do evil. There is something uh, 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 about young men and young women that are youthful in their sinful age. One of the best things that can happen is for them to get stung by their mistake. One of the best things that can happen is to be wounded without much loss, if I could say that. I'm, I'm speaking to my own life. One of the best things that happened to me is getting caught. I was the kid that always got caught. My cousin never got caught. He, is in, he was in a casket and placed in the ground. He was the guy that never got caught, thought he was invincible, and never would be caught. But be sure your sins will find you out. Oh, or false taught us and tried to teach us well, anybody that would listen. He said there's a difference between the judgment of God directly, the fury of God as spoken in the Old Testament where the fury is coming through his nostrils, where God is breathing out fury upon the world. He said, but there are judgments of sin. Sin alone has a consequence. It has a price tag on it. Uh, 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 listen, if you are in a marriage, you're subject to lose your marriage by adultery. Because sin has, alone, has a consequence. The Bible said that the wages of sin are death, eternal death, and, and the consequences of sin in this life. You break the law, they're coming after you. I've seen people receive the Holy Ghost, and, uh, after they, they had, uh, Uh, committed a crime, ended up going to prison because they still, even though God saved them, they still had to go out and uh, pay the price for their sin. There is a consequence for sin. And we need to understand that sin alone has a consequence. And sometimes it's not God judging you. It's your own sinful life and practice judging you. That's what it is. Because there's a consequence. You go and get in a sinful man's face and push him, he may shoot you this morning. There's a consequence for actions. One of the the best things that we can teach our children long. We don't need to be the hover and rescue parenting style that is always taking uh, and rescuing our children. I remember uh, stories of somebody forgetting a lunch. And the first time... Uh, the father 
left his job, ran up there and gave the son a lunch. The second time he called, I forgot my lunch. He said, son, mama, we'll have a big dinner at three. I know you're going to be hungry. Because I want you to understand that your lack of making the right choice has a consequence. And if you don't understand that it has a consequence, folks, you can't play with sin without there being consequences. There are consequences that are created by sin. But this is a powerful story in the book of 1 Chronicles because in spite of the consequence came a word and Israel would become famous because it even says in this text, every time you get in trouble, you run to God and he hears you. Every time you get in trouble, God hears you. But I wish that something could happen, that you could hear a sermon. Oh, I really do believe that possibly a man that's no longer 18 or 17 or Or you're not a boy, you're not a lad anymore. It's time to seek the Lord. I mean, you're, you listen, your life is ahead of you. Don't waste it with riotous living. I mean, we need to get a hold of ourselves. We're 30 and 40 and 50 years old and then we die. And then it's the judgment, the real judgment where God is going to make us be accountable for every deed done in our body. That's what the Word of God says, that He's going to take every deed. He said, uh, the writer said, knowing the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, (coughs) knowing that one day we're going to have to give an account for every deed done in our body. Every Everything we did, everything we didn't do, everything we should have done, God knows. So this was the particular setting of this chapter, and notice the Bible said that they offered unto the Lord at the same time of the spoil, which they had brought 700 oxen, 7,000 sheep, so which they had literally taken from the Ethiopians. Now notice that whosoever then would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman, he said, these are the words of their covenant, which commanded all idolaters to be put to death according to the law of God. And so they were saying, if you don't seek God and you continue to seek your idolatrous ways, uh, we need God to hear us and we need God to help us. And this was in the Old Testament and so they were living according to the law, and according to the law in the book of Deuteronomy, we are going to kill you if you don't go into a covenant to seek the Lord. Well, uh, I have good news and bad news. The good news is we can't kill anybody for not seeking the Lord. That's the good news. The bad news is we can't kill anybody for not seeking the Lord. Because if there's anybody that needs the blessing of God upon them, it is Hope Center Church. Did you hear me? But the Bible said in the New Testament it takes a a shift. And the shift is nobody's going to kill you for not seeking the Lord. But they do use the same terminology in that it's your responsibility to mortify the deeds of your body. In other words, you have uh, your own personal responsibility to mortify the deeds of your body. The sinful deeds of your body you are responsible for. So he said, nobody's going to kill you for your ungodly deeds. You need to kill the ungodly deeds within your own self. You need to take the sword of the Spirit. You need to execute judgment You need to say enough is enough. My days of living double are over. My days of a double life are over. I'm going to seek the Lord with all of my heart, my soul, and my mind. This would be a good time to seek the Lord. Notice the blessing that would come to a nation, and that is what motivated judgment should not motivate you 
to want to live for God more. That's backwards. The mercy of God should make you want to live for Him more. The fact that God has not rewarded you, the fact that God has not given you what you have deserved should make you want to love Him more and serve Him more and talk to Him more and communicate with Him more and be more and do more and and love Him more. I, I, I hope I'm getting across this simple thought. Judgment should not be your motivator. Mercy should. And that's what I picked up in this text. That it was mercy that motivated them to further consecration. It wasn't judgment. It it wasn't somebody declaring judgment upon them. God's going to reward you for your actions. You're going to be blessed of God. Okay, we're going to, we're going to consecrate more. We're going to bless more for all of the people that make radical decisions and make ridiculous statements like holiness doesn't matter and things doesn't matter and and we're just there are no boundaries and there's no need for lines and and we don't need any separation and certainly don't need a preacher to tell me how to live then take that whole own philosophy to your children take it to their children tell your children that coloring within the lines is not necessary that you can color as a 12 and 15 and 20 year old, it's all right to color outside of the lines. Boundaries does not matter. Nothing is important. But I would say to every parent that is here, you, you want boundaries for your children. You want boundaries. You, you don't want an uncle thinking there's no boundaries around your children. Not an evil uncle. Can I get a witness somebody? You want to teach your children. That's a no-fly zone. They can't touch you there. You want to create boundaries. Come on, everybody. The church needs boundaries. The church needs law. God did not undo the moral law of God. Under grace, it sounded as though it was even more intense. You say you should not commit adultery. I say. That to look upon a woman to lust after her if you've already had her in your heart. What are you talking about trying to catch Jesus and put him in a corner as though (coughs) the law is the only thing that is important? But you notice when you cross testaments, he did not say the law is not important anymore. That grace takes away. The moral law of God will always be important. The law is important. And notice in Scripture, when there was no law, no communicator of the law, nobody to establish boundaries, what did they do? They went into deeper idolatry. They got in more trouble. They got more sinful. They became wicked and worse and worse. But then a prophet came along and said, you're doing some right things. Continue to do them and God's going to reward the effort. God's going to bless you for that. Folks, 12 years without law can make a society go crazy. Can you imagine a proclamation upon the city of San Antonio? 12 years of no law. 12 years of no law. 12 years do anything you want to. It won't take long in a Pentecostal church or any other kind of church to have life with no laws. Who ever heard of that? There won't be any Pentecost left in those environments. There won't be any power left in those environments. It'll all be showmanship. It'll all be fleshy. There won't be, the Spirit of God won't be within (coughs) five feet of it. We need God, and we need to go into a covenant to seek the Lord. His mercy upon our nation. His grace upon our nation. The fact that we are still here as a nation and still preaching like this, that is a privilege, my friend. Thank God. Thank God for this nation. There are people that 
that are still burning flags, you know what? Those people need to be shipped. Everybody that that is speaking out against the United States of America ought to be shipped to a third world country and mandated to live there for two years. On their income, not our income. On their welfare system, not our welfare system. I believe in welfare. It's for people that can't work, not for people that won't work. Can I get a witness, somebody? Everybody ought to work. He that doesn't work isn't worthy to eat. You don't work, you're you're worse than an infidel. My word, I only have 10 more minutes, so some of you saying, thank God, it's hot in here. Woo! Smoking up in the house this morning. Early, he came early preaching this morning. I'm telling you, it's time to seek the Lord. It's time to be modest at the church. It's time to be modest out of the church. It's time to be holy in the church. It's time to be holy outside of the church. It's time to be holy in the church. It's time to be holy on the job. It's time to worship in the church. Somebody said, you know, as a, as a kid, and you would know a kid was, was asking this statement. Is it really a sin to get in the back seat of the car and park? My question to them, I knew exactly what they were talking about. I said, can the cross fit in the back seat? If the cross can't fit in the back seat, and if you drag the cross into the bar with you, and the cross seems awkward on the stool, you better get out of there because you can't live anywhere you can't carry the cross. Oh my, am I in the right church? Will the cross fit in the back seat of the car? Will Jesus stay and watch what you're watching with you and say, give me the popcorn? Am I in the right church? I'm talking about making a covenant to love God with all of our heart, soul, in mind, not one thing in the church and something outside of the church. Church is a hospital for sinful, hurting humanity. But if the church is as sick as the world is, we're not going to be able to help anybody sick that's in the world. And they said it's time to go into covenant with the Lord. The Lord's been so good because they noticed the minute they turn as a nation, the minute they turn as a people, the minute they go into covenant, there, there's power in numbers. And the minute we went into covenant with God, He began to reward our covenant of consecration. He began to bless us as a people. Can I tell you that we are the most blessed people in the world? God has been so good to us. God has been so faithful to us. And if there was ever a time that we needed to consecrate as a result of His faithfulness, this is what they did. They said... It's time. Notice our text this morning. He said, The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you be with him. A consecrated body will guarantee his blessings. He said, if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. In other words, you live your double life and act as if it's okay. You don't give him 
your complete whole heart, mind, and soul. You're not going to receive the blessing of God. But he said, God, God will reward you if you seek him. Now, for a long season, notice verse 3. Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without a law. They didn't have a, 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 a preacher. They didn't have anybody to remind them with sermons like this that would say the law is still important. Not the Levitical law, not the first five books, not the Pentateuch taught by Moses, but the moral law of God is as important today as it's always been. If God hated it then, He hates it now. The sins that would cause God to regurgitate, the sins that would turn as it was His stomach, still turn His stomach. God loves people, but He still hates sin. And the decree was was a very good decree. He said, you seek Him, you'll be found of Him. You come to Him with your whole heart, He's going to be waiting on you. Notice verse 4, as I've already spoken to you this morning. But when they were in trouble, they did turn unto the Lord their God of Israel and sought Him, and He was found of them. Every time, the prophet said, every time you've been in trouble... He was there for you. But when are you going to straighten up and seek Him with all your heart, your soul, and your mind? Well, I messed up, and I I am a preacher of mercy. But when are we going to move to a place of maturity? When are we going to move beyond just verbally saying, I love you, Jesus, and make commitments to Him that prove it? Make commitments to Him that show it and reveal it. This is the type of living for God that will affect your children. This is the type of living for God that will give your children substance and hope for the future. It's not vacillating between opinion. It's not unholy today and holy tomorrow. It's not living one way at church and then speaking out against the church and righteousness. God forbid that anybody that, that, that would start, cease from pursuing righteousness, that's one thing, but speaking out against as though you're in opposition of righteousness is a whole nother thing together. Can you imagine how quick you can find yourself in trouble when you begin to say that righteousness and holiness, none of that's important. I, all of those rules, that's, that's not important. What if while my wife was trying to teach my daughter that don't go out of the fence and the gate is extremely important and there's a road that's dangerous, I was getting in the baby's ear and saying, nah, don't listen to her. That doesn't make a, a, a bit of sense. That gate has absolutely no meaning. You're five years old, girl. You can do anything you want to do. If you want to go through the gate and on the other side of the fence, you go. In fact, I'll put toys out there that will lure you out there so you can play in the street. That's the way the devil works. That's the way the devil talks. That's the way backslid people speak. Oh, my. Did you hear me? I may not get an amen. That's the way backslid people. That's the way deceived people talk. Do anything you want. That's not important anymore. And it won't take much of no priest and no law until God. There will be idolatry. There will be lasciviousness. People will will take a cheap grace message as though nothing. And then their marriages are destroyed. Their children are destroyed. They have no apostolic heritage to hold on to. Is there anybody in the house today that understands Going into covenant with God and living something is important. Living it is so important. And there are people that put all of their emphasis on standards and have no holiness. No mercy, no grace, no kindness, no compassion, no long-suffering. I believe we can be the church that has it all. 
I believe we're, God wants us to be the church that is long suffering, gentle, kind, not judgmental, doesn't, isn't hard, isn't mean, isn't trying, uh, to, to, to be holier than thou. I believe this church can, can be at all. That God can help us. And the only way that we will ever see it is when there is a covenant to seek the Lord. Would you stand with me as a musicians? Come this morning, a covenant to seek Him. I'm inviting all of you to come around the front, <laughs> if you would, come. And notice when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Obed the prophet, he took courage. In other words, he said, wow, what a word. The word of God's continued support gave him courage. The fact that God would continue to work with me as a man in spite of my imperfections, that God, in spite of 12 years of pursuing idolatry without a priest, that God will still work with us, that God will still help us. And just as every time we got in trouble, we cried out to God, but he said, we need to go into a covenant. Not just a one-day covenant, but a covenant to seek him. A covenant to really serve him. A covenant to be pleasing to him. If there's anything in this last season of life, some of us serve approaching 30 years of age, some 40, some 50, some 60. Can you imagine some 50 or 60-year-old changing the entire schematic of what's important now and what's necessary? Change all the rules and nothing is even important anymore? That suddenly everything that brought us to this moment was just a hoax and nobody did it right and they were old fogey and... None of that's important. That's how you talk when there is no priest. That's how you talk when you're in a a society where the moral law of God is not important anymore. Where pleasing God is not on the mind of a people and a nation. But I hope today that it could start with us. That pleasing God is the most important thing. Not being holier than any other church in town not being more righteous so that we can be self-righteous, but being pleasing to God. God saying, in this people I'm well pleased. They are who they say they are. They love purely. They give me their whole heart, their soul, and their mind. I'm so thankful that God is love. I'm so thankful that God is full of grace and full of mercy. He gathered all Judah, Benjamin, and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon. For they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord God was with him. When they saw the blessing upon Asa, the preacher that said, we're going in, it's time to seek the Lord. When he said, God is calling us and, and you've heard it prophesied that God is well pleased and will continue to reward our efforts. When they saw that, people began to gather and said, now that we know that Asa is leading them to seek the Lord, we will also come. And thousands began to join him because people really do want to be where the moral law of God is is important people really do want to be you say oh people don't want this kind of preaching anymore oh, they really do because there's safety and boundaries when it's presented properly and not mean and not harsh and not hateful when they understand that God does not create boundaries to create prison houses but he does it for our own protection and it becomes the greatest liberty can, can you, how foolish people that have left the church and years later the things that hit their own personal lives and was exposed, their own sins came forward 
And I remember hearing about celebrations when they would leave the organization and no longer being bound by standards. They would call it liberating services where they got up and proclaimed that we're now free. Passed out scissors in the congregation and ran and celebrated their freedom. Can you imagine that? People that preached this truth and loved this truth and then made mockery of the truth that they had preserved only for all of their junk 10, 15 years later to come out and to come to surface. And yes, self-righteous people on both sides of the fence, there is a ditch. On both sides of Calvary, there is a bad place. There is a ditch. You hear me? Because people can be so self-righteous and and preach so hard that they can't even live it their own self and they don't live it and their seed doesn't live it. And I know I'm making some very bold declarations, but our safety is to seek He who is on that middle cross. Holiness and righteousness cannot be legislated through a rule book, but through a loving relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lords. All our do's and all our don'ts must be because of Jesus Christ. It's not, my church won't let me, my preacher, that that is so shallow. But because of my commitment to Jesus Christ, there are some places I cannot go. There are some things I cannot do. There are some things I cannot wear. There are some actions I cannot take because I love Him. They made a covenant to seek the Lord with all of their heart. And would you right now join me? This is a time to seek the Lord with all of our heart. A covenant to seek the Lord. To make a dedication of our heart, our soul, and our mind completely and wholly unto Him. Lord, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Lord, I thank You today for Your blessings, for Your goodness, for Your grace for your kindness. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you are doing and you are blessing. Thank you for a covenant where your people join to praise you, to pray, to walk with you, to talk with you. Now I want you to hear this. To me, this is the most important part of the sermon because when they're now is a priest. Now there's a prophet. Obed has spoke. Now Asa is bringing law to them. Now notice. Notice this verse. This is so powerful. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting, with trumpets and cornets. Notice. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire and he was found of them and the Lord gave them rest round about even from their enemies. When they went into a covenant to seek the Lord, there was joy that entered into the tabernacle, not bondage, but freedom. When they went into a covenant and said, As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to seek the Lord. If you don't seek the Lord, you're going to die. Nobody can stay in this community without seeking God wholly with their whole heart. Don't leave anything in reserve. Give God everything. Then they got the base. Then they got the keys. Then they got the cornets. Then they got the drums. Then singing and joy came into the atmosphere. Why? Because God now could bless a people who had made the right choice to go into a covenant of prayer. We're going to seek Him. We're going to serve Him. We're going to love Him. We're all going to love Him. Would you begin to praise God and thank Him and let this be more than just a praise service? Let it be your personal commitment to serve the Lord. Oh, yes, I love you, Jesus. 
Lord, let it be a season, a season of searching our heart, searching our soul. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. A covenant to seek the Lord. Let us make a covenant as a church. It's time to seek the Lord. It's time to search for Him. It's time to give Him every corner of our heart. Every soul. Oh, yes. I dedicate. I dedicate my house. I dedicate my temple. I dedicate my mind. I dedicate my spirit. I dedicate, Lord, so that there be no doubt, no unbelief, no double standard, no vacillating opinion. Today, we want to seek the Lord.